This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. There's no question that uh, new technology, and in particular, social media, have shaped global events this year. So during this session, we're going to have leading experts and entrepreneurs who will examine how technology has spurred globalization. They'll also look at how emerging technologies are changing the way that we inter interact with each other on a social level. And, uh, Specific areas of innovation that we'll be discussing today will be supercomputing, software and video gaming, simulated reality, cyber infrastructure, social media, and wireless technology. And we might even find out what Evan Williams' next project is. So with that, please welcome Evan Williams and Jim Fallows. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe, for that gracious introduction. Thanks to you all for coming here. I am uh, Jim Fallows from the Atlantic Monthly here with Evan Williams. There was a touching episode a few minutes ago where the two of us were standing together and somebody innocently asked which one was the, uh, the guy from Twitter. I, I, I <laughs> so I took this as a, as a high note in my life. I, I will, I'll, I'll, I'll tell, my, I'll tell my, my, my children about that. It's a real pleasure for me personally to have Evan Williams here, and I think it's a very natural con continuity, uh, continuation of our program because it's it's all been about people with wide-ranging interest, wide-ranging accomplishments, who may be able to talk about the interaction of all the forces we've been talking about, about technology, about government, about health, about exploration, science, and all the rest. Um, Evan Williams, as you know, but I'll say it uh, just, just for the record too, has been a very important uh, technological entrepreneur and, and innovator. He was the co-founder first of Pyra Labs, that's the right pronunciation, right, which founded Blogger, which uh, is now part of, of Google, and you worked at Google for a while and then more recently the co-founder of Twitter, which has had a profound influence on, on life uh, in ways, ways both, both good and bad. Uh, he was born and raised, well, <laughs> we'll, we'll get into that. We'll get into that, whether how those, those things net out. Born and raised in a farm in central Nebraska, now lives in San Francisco, and lists his pastimes in addition to changing the world as being long walks in the city, tofu and bourbon, which sounds like a good confluence of, of its own. Um, I'd like to start with sort of a personal positioning question. We've heard from the several distinguished predecessors uh, on, the, on the stage here about the ways in which their interesting effect on the world was shaped, how they became the kind of people they are now. How did you from central Nebraska become the co-founder of Twitter and Blogger? Um. And sort of the central insight which made a farm boy think, this is something I want to do, this is something I can do. Yeah. Um. It certainly isn't a path that, that I would have anticipated. Um, I did grow up literally in the middle of cornfields, uh, outside a town of 400 people, and I was there was no internet, obviously, so so it was a lot of alone time building Legos and wood shop and and whatnot. And I got it in my mind very early that I was going to be an entrepreneur. I don't know if I use that term, but um, as soon as I learned that term, I used that term and just. It, but I remember playing with the little cars and Legos and, and, and imagining my empire, um, which I probably pictured a lot more like Elon Musk's empire, where there's <laughs> car companies and spaceships and stuff. Um, I haven't accomplished that. But um, I stumbled upon the internet in um, 93, I think. I don't know how, I think I was toying around with computers not from a super young age. I, I had taken a programming course in high school, loved it, thought I'm going to be a computer programmer. And I, um, then I didn't really have access because of the school I went to and, and other factors. So 
got away from that, but always kept the idea I'd, I'd be an entrepreneur, c came back at computers as a way, as a route to that, and um, played with online uh, services, AOL, CompuServe, and then found the internet and decided, well, this, this seems like it'll be a big thing. I started an internet company in 94, in because you could be that specific and say it was an internet company. And had all kinds of ideas, had no idea what I was doing. I mean, I'd never had a job before, so starting a company was fairly ludicrous, but um, I mean, I never had a job in an office. I, my jobs were on the farm and, you know, fast food place. Um, so, but that's actually a very encouraging touch that you mentioned, that you went from fast food to your, yeah. your career. So I thought I was well qualified to start a technology company. <laughs> Um, and I was still in Nebraska, and there wasn't really a lot of people around. I, I tried to raise money, and I would go to the, the people who had money there made their money in cattle or plumbing, or, and so um, my task was to explain to them what the internet was, and that was going to be a big deal, <laughs> and how equity investments work. Private. It was it was not easy. I didn't didn't end up raising a lot of money. Um, but got some friends together and we, we tried to create some internet stuff and learned a bunch of stuff. Dismal failure as a business. Um, eventually made it out to California where, where people were actually building stuff. Um, I had a couple jobs before I, I started my next company, which was Pyra Labs. Um, and that started with the idea, by then I had, I had learned enough to actually build software and, and websites and web applications. And that started out with the idea that I, um, I wanted to build a system for people to collaborate online and work together as a productivity tool, actually. Blogger was a side project of that company, which I've always had a problem focusing, um, kind of like Elon Musk. Um, <laughs> And so we started the side project, Blogger, a, a couple months into starting this other company. And Blogger was this very simple idea of you can type something and hit a button and it posts on the web. And so we didn't invent web blogs, as they were called at the time, before they were called blogs. Uh, but, but we thought, oh, that's a neat idea. Let's write this little application to make it easy to do that. And maybe, maybe if people see that, they'll then find out about our real product, the, the more complicated productivity product. And of course, the simple thing is what ended up being the hit. And um, we were bootstrapping that for the first year, working on the side on, on the contract programming jobs. Um, then Blogger eventually grew, and that um, I ran it for four years, and I sold it to Google. And that was sort of off to the races. Because you are unusual in many ways, but including in having experience both in the strict blogging world by, uh, by creating Blogger and now, of course, w with Twitter, I wonder if you would comment on whether these forms of social media are a natural evolutionary extension of themselves, I mean, Twitter from, from Blogger. What I have in mind is a lot of a line the last year or two that Twitter has sort of obviated blogs, you know, that blogs are over once Twitter has come. How do you think of the line of descent from Blogger or ascent from, uh, sure. from blogs to Twitter? Um, well, one line is just about lowering the barrier. And that's and most of what, looking back, I've done in my career is, is made it easier and easier to, for someone to have a thought and expose it in such a way that a worldwide audience could see it. And I thought th that was pretty, um, they're, they're actually very, very, very similar. And the funny thing is, the early, couple years of Blogger were very similar to the early couple years of Twitter, which was a lot of people saying, why would anyone do that? <laughs> um, who cares? And uh, eventually people, and, and it's true, because if you make it really, really easy for anyone in the world to share their thoughts, you know, what if you listen to every phone call that everybody ever had? Are you going to hear profound things most of the time? Uh, probably not. But, but once in a while, there's really important things being communicated or they're important to a very small number of people. And so I believe passionately about giving a voice to as many people as possible, and that, that voice, creating systems where that voice can resonate with the right audience. And uh, over the years, I heard story after story of important things happening, 
happening either on the personal or the global level because of these communication channels which weren't open before. So I see them as essentially the same thing. And um, Twitter, of course, lowering the barrier another order of magnitude um, from, from where blogs were in that you don't have to set anything up, essentially. The constraint of 140 characters <clears throat> lowers the, a lot of the psychological barrier to even writing something in the first place where you think you have to have something that is well-structured and that's not even an option, so you just kind of fire it out there. Um, and, and the way t Twitter has impacted blogging is um, it has definitely impacted it on the casual level. And um, so there's what I call casual bloggers, which are people who aren't doing it for money or for um, really even a hobby. It's more just like I have thoughts I want to share them. I get some feedback. It's a lot about interacting with other people. Uh, for that use case, a lot of um, a lot of people have turned to turn to Twitter or other lighter weight publishing systems um, more and more. On the other side, there are there are probably more professional or commercial bloggers than ever before, and Twitter and other social media are very complementary to that because they drive traffic. We're going to talk now about the effects on the world that social media in general, Twitter in particular, have had. And I thought I'd start that by asking you, what has surprised you about Twitter's effect on the world compared to what you were thinking, say, five or six years ago? Hmm. Um, well, there, there's constant, constantly surprises about Twitter. At this point, we have over 100 million active users. So uh, Twitter is everywhere. If any major event happens in the world, Twitter is there. And it, it impacts Twitter. And it has this, it reverberates throughout Twitter. And so at this point, very little surprising. It's just it happened in the world. Then, then we see there's, there's it, at least is reflected on Twitter. Uh, sometimes then there's a feedback loop and it causes more of something to happen. Uh, so that's been surprising. Certainly uh, the, the biggest things are the Middle East thing, um, stuff that's happened. And I'm not an expert on all that. So there's been a lot of debate as to how much Twitter and social media affected those uprisings. Um, I don't honestly know, but I, d I have seen from early days in, in Twitter a phenomenon we've noticed and I've come to believe will have much bigger impact in the years to come with the internet is people seeing that other people think the same way they do and that emboldening them to act. And a simple early example we saw probably in 2007 that I always remember was, was someone in Toronto, I think it was, it was around Christmas time, and they they saw the, some homeless people on the street, and they they thought, you know, it's super cold out. What can we do to help these people? And it's probably a thought a lot of people had had. You know, people have that thought every all the time. But he tweeted something about it, and other people in Toronto saw that tweet, and it started a conversation, and it turned into action where they said, OK, let's all, you know, tomorrow take a bunch of food and blankets down. We'll meet on this intersection and, and help these people out. And that, to me, is a great example of, of when you facilitating an action by, by linking people together who share a desire or a thought and allowing them to act where that otherwise that thought may have been isolated amongst each of them and probably nothing would have ever happened. And we've seen other examples like that. So I'm convinced that if you let people organize, mm -hmm. even let them express something, and then um, let other people see that, that people share their viewpoint, um, things can happen that otherwise wouldn't have happened. And respecting your position that you're not here as a political analyst of the Middle East or anything else, there are two aspects that I did want to just get your thoughts on about Twitter's role and social media's role in recent political developments. One is the news during the Arab Spring that the U.S. State Department was essentially becoming an ally of, of, of Twitter from the company's point of view, recognizing you have some arm's length from it. Did you, how did you feel about that embrace by the State Department? The other is the Chinese analogs of Twitter. You know, Twitter itself doesn't operate there, but Weibo does. And what you've, have you observed anything interesting about the way this pattern is unfolding in a controlled society in China? 
so on the first point, the, you know, the thing that happened during the Iranian revolt was we, we had advertised uh, or you know, announced a, a, main, a planned downtime for Twitter. And it turned out that that downtime, it, for us, it was late at night in, in Iran. It was during when some important thing was happening. I forget exactly what. And a lot of people came to us and said, hey, can you postpone that? Because this is a really bad time. And including um, some folks from the State Department who reached out. And at first, that was, this was early, I think. So um, we, were, we were flattered and surprised by this attention. But we were also nervous about that. Because we, we thought it was critical that we are viewed as a neutral party. And Twitter is a global system. And the last thing we wanted to do was look like we're an arm of, of the US government. And um, so I think it was actually, we would have preferred that they hadn't reached out, or at least that no one knew they reached out, because we, you know, that, that's not good for, for a global PR perspective. It was good from like, hey, Twitter sounds really important if the State Department's reaching out to you. But um, it didn't drive our decision necessarily. It was just, uh, it, was a, it was a weighing between the risks of putting off the maintenance and um, getting our provider, to, uh, our uh, network provider to agree and, and all these other factors. And we decided to put off the maintenance. But um, we always wanted to make it very clear that it wasn't because the State Department asked. And still to this day, I've talked to people who, you know, from Egypt and, and other places who Partially because of that, but partially just because we're in the U.S., they assume we're, we are controlled by the government. And um, that's something that we, we always want to, uh, it, it doesn't help us. They, we want them to trust our system. And on, on the Chinese front now, how you see your counterpart, the, the alternative universe Twitter unfolding in China? Um, well, you probably know more about this than I do, so I'd love you to tell us. But what, from my understanding, so yeah, we're, we've been blocked in China from very early on. And we've talked to people in China about, hey, you should partner with us. You should come to China. And essentially, we've said we're not interested in that because um, before, <laughs> before I, and let me mention a brief tangent here. I do not speak on behalf of Twitter. I'm not, I'm not paid to do that anymore. Um, so when I say we, um, I'm, I'm talking mostly retroactively. I'm a member of the board. Um, but I am, I'm no longer at the company day to day. So I have to be careful when I'm speaking as Twitter, um, which I'm not. So I can speak much more recklessly than, than normal. <laughs> Good. If I've talked to Twitter um, communication, they probably said, don't, don't talk about China. That's crazy. Um, so anyway, I'll talk personally about China. Um, from what I understand, well, from, from my perspective, it. Twitter is about personal expression and, and free speech. So fundamentally, the way to operate in China, you can operate this kind of service. You just have to make sure, basically, people censor themselves. And you have to make sure that, um, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but you, people register, essentially, and they can be tracked. And then if someone says something that they shouldn't have said, um, the government has the data, or they ask for the data to find out who that was, and they go have a friendly chat with them, from what I understand. <laughs> And the technical so, term is have tea. That's literally what they call really? it. Really? Yeah, we come have tea with me. <laughs> uh, so we just didn't want to be in a position like Google and Yahoo. Now that we we didn't. In order to do that, they you need to have an office there and have servers there. So they have some leverage on you, and then your office, your your employees um, uh, are are used. To potentially against you. So we never wanted to be in that situation, and we didn't want. Um, to, to even have a service where people couldn't, couldn't really express themselves truly. So what's happened instead is competitors have, or clones essentially, have grown up in China that, that serve this purpose for that market. And from what I understand, they're doing quite well as in terms of business or, or user growth. Um, beyond that, I'm not sure. 
Let me turn now to the domestic perspective on Twitter. There are a number of complaints or concerns about what this form of communication will do for the world. It will make people even stupider than they are. It will create uh, rep wiener type situations. Uh, it will make people go even further into their own little sort of siloed information spheres. What do you think, what are the most legitimate concerns to have about this stage in social media? And, and what, what do you worry about this, about this stage of social media? I think all the concerns are legitimate. I mean, I think uh, I've been thinking about this a lot in context of my new company because we're we really want to focus on things that have really big positive impact, and um, and so I've been thinking about how do you measure that or how do you determine that ahead of time and think about television, for instance, and basically every com new communication channel was going to be this utopian save of the world. Uh, idea is going to television was going to bring education and information into homes, and everyone was going to be enlightened and connected across the country, and um, that had some unintended consequences. And I think all these systems have unintended consequences, even though we can point to all these positive, um, affirmative uses of them. And so, I think when when you build a system like this, you try, you try, and you hope for it to be used more constructively than destructively. But, but I think of it, about it kind of as a power tool. I want to enable, I want to empower people to do more than they could before. And so if you want to do that, you have to believe that generally people are more good than they are bad or will use that power um, for more good than bad. And you hope for if it's you know 15% more good than bad, and if it's really really big, then that's a lot of good. Um, and it's like a power tool, and that it's like like a, a table saw. And if you're a rep wiener, you can slip and you can cut off your finger, so to speak. And uh, <laughs> sorry. And uh, so. That happens. Does that mean we shouldn't have table saws? No, that would really slow down a lot of building of constructive things. Um, but you try to, I think you can bias these systems to a certain degree in, in little things about what you call things and how, what you allow and um, how you shape them, how you shape the community and the, 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 the mores on these systems can um, bump them a little bit more toward constructive behavior. but. I think there's a lot of destructive things people can do. I wanted to follow up one thing you mentioned there before asking about your, your next um, project. You were saying your fundamental belief is that people are more good than bad, will use tools for more good than bad. I've heard Eric Schmidt, for example, about Google make that, that, that exact point about having uh, the world's information be available. Um, all of our previous speakers have made a sort of similarly optimistic point about the trajectory of human nature. Political philosophy is basically, is based on the premise that people are bad. That they have to. There is a famous phrase of "men were angels." You know, no government would be would be necessary. Does this, is this a huge culture clash? Do you think between the tech world and the world of politics and international affairs that one is based on tragedy and one is based on on optimism? Maybe that's why when we go to D.C., we we can't seem to have any useful conversations. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I, maybe it's just a requirement of succeeding as an entrepreneur in the tech world that you you see uh, these these positive outcomes and you kind of downplay the negative outcomes. And if you didn't, it's not that it's right. It's just the people who succeed have to believe that, or they wouldn't succeed, or they wouldn't try. And so, yeah, if if you were inventing table saws and you thought most people are going to cut their fingers off, you probably wouldn't bother. Um, so, um, you know, maybe it's just a necessary belief. But, but it does seem to be a disconnect with a lot of the world, for sure. Tell us, if you would, about your next project, how it will change our lives, and when we will look for it to do so. Um, well, it's a little soon to say uh, about the next project. but. Um, Essentially, what the new company is called the Obvious Corporation, and uh, it's actually a restart. Obvious was the company we spun Twitter out of uh, four years ago, 
And the idea was we were going to uh, create a series of products and basically be a, a development lab for new ideas. And uh, we, we worked on a couple things, but Twitter uh, very quickly became the, the thing we had to pay attention to um, for a few years. So that went pretty well. Now we're back in the lab, essentially trying to think of about what's next. It's myself and Biz Stone, another co-founder of Twitter, and, and Jason Goldman, who is a VP of product at Twitter. Uh, and now we have a team of a few other people, some engineers, and um, we are essentially playing around, but I'm super excited about this phase right now because I've never, now that I've been doing internet startups for about 15 years or as long as there have been internet startups, um, there, I've never seen more opportunity. And in fact, the opportunities are multiplying faster than, than we can implement on them. If you, someone's just mentioning to me the other day how the new iPhone came out, and it's twice as fast as the iPhone that came out last year, and we have even, even scratched the surface right. on thinking of the ideas that we could take advantage of the last, you know, the last hardware for. And, and all these, um, you know, the Twitters and Facebooks and Googles and everything are getting very, very big, and they're, in some ways, they're kind of getting a lock on their market, but they're all creating as many opportunities and new ecosystems among themselves and new ways. Um, so all this is just, the ocean is rising and there's more and more uh, opportunities to do more stuff and more capabilities. And so the hardest thing about starting something now is, is just trying to focus and figure out what to do. But um, so we're, th we're thinking about the future of media, having been in this, this publishing world for a long time. Um, one of the big things we're thinking about is What's next? I think a lot of people, especially from the media world, have focused on how the internet has basically destroyed their business, um, <laughs> which is true. Even, even if you can acknowledge a lot of the positive aspects of lots of people being able to publish, lots of information being out there, the distribution costs being uh, tiny, there's lots of positive impacts of that. I think we have yet to um, apply a lot of things the internet is good at to media beyond lowering distribution costs and lowering the barrier. Um, I think there's all kinds of ways we can, um, one major theme I'm, I'm thinking about is how do you, you help people collaborate to create something better than existed before? This is one of the things that the internet is great at and there's examples from really early like open source software and Wikipedia being, being the one that most people have seen, where lots and lots of people um, contributing a tiny bit can create this hole that's much greater. And, um, but there aren't as many examples of that as, as I think there could be. And I think that could apply all over the place. It could apply to the real world from like, you know, how do we create a community garden or how do we get this law passed or Kickstarter is a great example of a site that lets people contribute to create some product or, or um, company in little bits by, by pledging $100 or $10 and make something happen that wouldn't otherwise happen. And um, I think that that principle in general is, is what the internet could be great at and is not yet, not that yet there for the most part. Um, I think there's also ways that we can tap into the collective intelligence of on the internet to, to help people get smarter. I think there's also, there's so much of the focus of the internet to help people sh show people what the next interesting thing is, but there's little to help you pay attention to what you really care about. And so I think all these are interesting problems. It's just one area we're thinking about with obvious and um, we'll see. <laughs> Um, we have about 60 seconds left on stage, so this is a, an obvious type uh, Twitter challenge for you. What, what's, in, in a sentence or two, what's the main thing that you wish all the rest of us understood about the revolution you're, you're in the middle of, that we don't understand? <clears throat> well, I, th I think the biggest thing is that we've only scratched the surface. And people have kind of come to accept this. They know the pace of change is phenomenal. And yet, people still accept the status quo in most areas, from, from government, from their institutions, from organizations, from their neighborhoods. 
and um, from their technology. A lot of it is still pretty primitive and, easy, and hard to use, and it doesn't do at all what, what it's capable of. And so I think thinking bigger and demanding more and, and just setting a higher bar and saying what if, uh, I would really encourage, because I don't think there's enough of that, and I think we, we focus too much on the incremental, and uh, there's just so much more to do. Thank you so much. Please join me in thanking Evan Royal for what he's done. And getting here. Starting on my far right is Susan Shirk, who's familiar to all of you here at UCSD. She's a longtime friend of mine from the China, China Beat, and she is uh, she's the director of the, of the Institute on Global Conflict and Cooperation and has so many um, publications on China that I would use up all of our time if I started listing them. I'll simply say that she's provided me fodder in many a speech about China over the past couple of years because Susan's, uh, one of her recent books about China was called Fragile Superpower. And the wonderful anecdote she tells is that when she's in the U.S., people say, what do you mean fragile? And when she's in China, they say, what do you mean superpower? And this does, <laughs> this does encapsulate a lot of what is going on. Um, we have Larry Smarr in the middle from the California Institute for Telecommunications and Information Technology, the founding director of that institute, and uh, has, again, so many professorships that I will let you read them in, in the, uh, the, the, uh, the dossier. I'll say an outstanding expert on the convergence of data and real life, data and medical science, what we do with the ever-increasing power of to manipulate and acquire data to be able to change uh, ongoing and, and long-standing problems in life. Now we have Peggy Johnson from Qualcomm, who is Executive Vice President and President of Global Market Development at Qualcomm. And she has uh, an expert on wireless technology, which has new relevance to us just at this moment on, on stage. But Qualcomm, of course, part of the combined wireless tech and life sciences tech uh, powerhouse that has been so important in San Diego in, in, in recent years. So I would like to um, start with you uh, Peggy Johnson, we were hearing from Evan Williams just now about the way that social media have had an effect domestically, culturally, individually, and politically. Um, what do you think is the next stage of understanding the effect of wireless technology and, and in what other ways that we're not yet anticipating? Can we make sense of Evan Williams' closing comment that we're just scratching the surface? What do you see and know about that the rest of us should be aware of and the potential here? Um, well, a couple things. Um, so first of all, I've, I've had the pleasure of seeing for the last 22 years at Qualcomm the accelerating pace of innovation in, in this field from voice to data to computers in our hands. So it's been amazing. And we at Qualcomm feel the same way. We're just scratching the surface. A couple of things coming up next sort of uh, that we'll hear about in the next one to three years are peer-to-peer um, -peer communications. So when you think about the Arab Spring and when some of the governments were shutting down the, the infrastructure, how great would it be for your radio in your pocket, and there's many radios in your cell phone, to talk to someone close by? And that's very possible. That's something that I think, um, you know, in a Twitter fashion, you could, you could relay messages and then out to a point outside the, the country. Um, so that's, that's one thing that's coming. Another thing is this idea of context that uh, Ev talked a little bit about it, just knowing um, you, we have this deluge of data coming at us all the time. What do you do with all of it? How do you filter it appropriately for you, which is different from me and for each of us here? And part of that is uh, your phone will and is starting to have many, many sensors on it. It has a few things now, an accelerometer, a few, you know, few uh, lightweight sensors, but there's a lot more coming, and we can know where you're at, um, what's important to you, we can listen to your surroundings, and we can feed you appropriate data at the appropriate time um, so you don't, you're not overwhelmed. So those are a couple things that are, that are coming that I think in the hands of our developers out there could turn into some fascinating innovations. And I'm just going to ask you one follow-up question here. I was seeing, for reasons I'll get into later, a wonderful old movie a couple days ago called Mona Lisa. It's a noir set in London with Bob Hoskins, and it's great. But one of the riveting scenes in it was when they give Bob Hoskins a cell phone. He says, how does this work? How does it know where to send me the signals? You know, how does it know what the number is? So that was 20 years ago. People had not seen. He, that could be a plot element in a movie. 20 years from now, 
what do you think would be a, if people look back to the movies right now, what would they find unbelievably primitive about our cell phone, our wireless technology? Well, the fact that it's not um, monitoring what's going on on our bodies right now. It's, so, it's a computer in your hands. It could, it could make such a better hearing aid, for instance. It could be signal processing in a much better way, more um, real time rather than you know, having to turn things up and down. It could be constantly measuring your blood pressure. It, it um, could be, it, you know, today when you put a blood pressure monitor on, you, um, or you might take your blood pressure once a day, obviously if you had a consistent view of that, it would, it would present a different picture to your doctor. So I think we'll look back and say, you know, our kids will say, what, you, know, you didn't know what your blood pressure was all the time? And, and, uh, you know, you know. So in addition to being very interesting, what you've said is a perfect segue to the work that Larry Smarr is doing. So, so would you give us the same perspective of what you're in the middle of that you think the rest of us don't know enough about and should be excited about? Well, uh, fortunately, you'll be able to come tonight to the Cal IT2 from 6 to 9 and see a lot of the virtual reality and extreme visualization, so I don't have to talk about that. Uh, but for the last 10 years since we were founded, uh, we have been looking at the digital transformation of the environment, energy, health, and culture. And uh, health in particular is probably the nearest term uh, change, uh, just as was mentioned. You know, the, the thing we know the least about is the insides of our body. How can you not know the state of your body? That's just nuts. And yet, we don't. And your car, you've got, you know, during the 50s, you had to go wait till smoke came out of the hood. That would be like having a symptom. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, in medicine today, right? Uh, wait till you're broken and then go to the doctor. And Anyway, the point is instead what we have is little flash memories at the spark plugs, the brakes, everything else that you know record every second. You go in the garage, it reads that out, it compares it with all the other cars like yours in the country over the net. And if you're in the middle of the bell curve for that value, then of course you're fine. If you're out here or something's off on one of the time series of the data, you pull a module out, put a new module in, and 200,000 miles later, your car runs just the way it did the day you bought it. Why aren't we doing that with our bodies? And so one of the things we've we explored is as the, in this 10 years, we've seen computers are now 1,000 times faster and 1,000 times cheaper, but genome sequencing is a million times cheaper than it was when the first human genome was done in 2000. That means that all doctors today operate without using your genetic information. And I was just talking to the new class of, of uh, medical students at UCSD last week, and I said, by the time you're in practice, you'll assume that you have the full genome of your patient and relative to all of the other uh, people in our population uh, as a basis for medicine. So we're in the, middle, in the middle of a radical shift. And so one of the things I've been doing in my own body is anticipating that. I, I take my blood every quarter. I measure, measure 60 different chemicals. I keep track of the state of my colon, where actually you have 10 times as many cells in your microbe as you do in your entire human body, and 100 times the genes in those microbes that you have in your human DNA, and that's completely ignored by doctors. In fact, they go in and napalm the, uh, with broad spectrum antibiotics uh, without any thinking about what that does to your immune system or anything else, because those genes and those microbes are co-expressing with your human genes to create you, and we ignore that. So there's this, this complete step function, I think, that we're in the middle of, and the ability to have the cell phone be your body area sensor and read this stuff out and into data banks that will be uh, possible to look across the population, hopefully of the privacy-conserving um, algorithms, uh, to really begin to understand uh, ourselves and, 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 and instead of having a sickness, fixing sickness paradigm, it will be instead a wellness paradigm that uh, each of us uh, takes more personal responsibility for keeping our own bodies in good shape. Let me ask one follow-up <clears throat> that I know could elicit a 10-hour answer, but, but for a sort of one-minute answer yeah. to it. 
Fundamentally, will these innovations mean that we could spend 100% of the GDP on healthcare, or will it be some way that we could put a ceiling on the GDP for healthcare? Well, currently, what is going to bankrupt our country before anything else, the biggest threat to our country, is that three quarters, we've grown to the point that three quarters of our people are overweight or obese, pre diabetic, and there's not enough money in the universe to take care of that. Until people take care of their own bodies, and avoid becoming chronically ill voluntarily, which is what we're doing now in a mass feet way in our culture, then uh, yes, we are going to completely bankrupt the country. What is the counter-revolution, what you see here in La Jolla, is uh, look around, and then go to the Midwest and look around and notice the difference. There is a counter-revolution of personal responsibility, personal health maintenance, thinking about what you eat, thinking about exercise, and it's spreading across the country. The question is, will it spread fast enough? So, Susan, one of your areas of longstanding expertise has been the interaction of media and politics, media and society. You're one of your, I think probably your latest book was this one on changing media in China. As you hear about these revolutions in monitoring and information transfer and health and communications, how do you think we should understand them politically, you know, their, their effect on societies and the social media and what it means in China, what it means in the U.S.? You as a political scientist, what do you think as you hear this sort of discussion these, or anything else you'd like to tell us? Well, as I think about uh, these innovations, I think that uh, in these fields, we're not going to see any cutting edge major innovations occurring in China because the, China has great ambitions to be uh, a technology superpower. But the way they're going about it is to throw a whole lot of money into it and to uh, have the central government set priorities and to give most of the money to research institutes and big state-owned enterprises. So uh, no garage-based innovation no uh, small-scale innovation of the type that we know uh, really matters. So uh, in some ways, however, of course, what China's accomplishing is very substantial. Uh, we have a project in which we're trying to look at these different areas of Chinese innovation more systematically. And uh, I have to tell you that one of the areas we thought was very successful was high-speed rail. <laughs> You Seriously. Followed, you? Yes. Well, you know, there was this terrible accident. So I think what that shows you is that that ambition, that mad rush to get things done quickly, the eagerness to, uh, because of nationalism and this kind of national ambition, to show that everything is Chinese origin technology, but in fact is not actually true. What's happening is that they are uh, adopting in one way or another foreign technologies. And then there is process innovation, which reduces the costs and makes things happen very quickly. And some of that is great for the world. Um, you know, the solar and wind um, uh, bubble in China, and it really is a kind of bubble, but what it's done is uh, create uh, the and engineered solar panels and wind uh, farms that other countries can adopt mu for a much lower price. And as uh, citizens of the planet, we all care about that because that will help, um, you know, reduce climate change. So it's a complicated picture. Yeah. And, and, and no doubt, because I have followed your works over the years, what you say sounds exactly right to me. But I, I want to ask one implication of it. You live here in San Diego, which is the focus of all this communications and life science innovation. You often travel to China, where lots of these things are sort of creamed off, and, and, and as, as you've just described. Do you have any cautions to give to your colleagues here in the life sciences and the, uh, the wireless field about how they should, uh, do they need to guard themselves against the next round of this being done from the Chinese, or just not worry about it? Well, I mean, I was listening to the discussion about Twitter. Now, with Facebook and Twitter being, fr and Google to a large extent, being frozen out of China, many of us said, okay, this is going to be bad for China because what we're gonna get is monopolistic companies in all of these sectors. They will have a Chinese um, version. Chinese version will be less good 
and it will be done by some monopolistic con company that's favored by the government. I don't think actually that's happened. I think that the Chinese recognize that some competition is good, and in the microblock space, for example, there uh, actually are two main uh, microblocks, uh, Tencent, TT, and Weibo. Weibo seems to be leading, but from what I see and what I understand is that Weibo has some features that are better than Twitter. And Weibo is going international. Weibo is going to Taiwan, they're going to Hong Kong, and there's no reason they couldn't go to non-Chinese so markets. You're not suggesting that those are crossing national boundaries, are you? <laughs> <laughs> this is an inside China joke, sorry. <laughs> I wouldn't, I, of course I would not say that, but. Um, there is one China. Right, but um, you know, watch out for Weibo. Yeah, oh, very interesting. So a, a, a recurring theme in our discussions here, recurring because I keep asking it, is about <laughs> the, 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 the pessimistic potential of some of these, um, some of these technological developments. And part of what you've descri been describing and all its, its potential is a sort of panoptican nightmare too, where everything about you is monitored all the time, you know how many days until you're going to die, everybody knows where, uh, the government knows where you are at all times. How do you think about the, the nightmare possibilities of omnipresent, every second communication and monitoring, and, and, and what, what do you think about that? Well, obviously that's, a, that's an issue, and we think about that a lot, um, but that's where I think having the computer in your hand on yourself and you controlling and allowing what crosses over into the cloud yeah. or elsewhere um, is, is an empowering thing that we need to think about and not push everything out that way. You, you hear a lot about um, the com computing in the cloud where our, our handsets are pretty, pretty hefty right now, mm -hmm. going you know, dual core, quad core, they're, um, they're capable of a lot and so if you could filter the information that comes into you and then process it custom to you and only allow what you want to go back the other way. I, so I think there are ways to help control that. Okay. And Larry, you mentioned appropriate privacy algorithms. Could you expand on that? Yeah, I mean, I think fundamentally we, we need a legal uh, reform <clears throat> in this country that you own your data. And just like the government can't come into your house with a search warrant, uh, they shouldn't be able to get your data Corporations shouldn't be able to get your data without your explicit permission or a process like court warrants. Uh, other countries, I think, have perhaps more sophisticated um, thinking about data, but it, it, since I will agree with Evan, you haven't seen anything yet. You're, you're gonna see hundreds, thousands of times as much data about yourself being generated as you have now. And so if we don't get on this soon, uh, it'll be too late, and then a lot of bad things could very well happen. But the fundamental reason that, like, I put all of my data out uh, on my portal or uh, on, on my PowerPoints uh, is because, you know, I'm, I can get a lot of people who have things like I have talking to me and sharing experiences, which is probably more knowledge to me about the things I care about than I'll ever get from 15 minutes twice a year with a doctor. And Susan, you're an expert on the society which has sort of taken the constant monitoring to its extreme. What can we learn about whether they'll be able to sustain that, whether that's a danger for us? Well, um, it's a race between the Chinese citizen and the Chinese state. And, the, uh, uh, and it, it does stimulate a lot of innovation on both sides. <laughs> Uh, I think that the, right now the microblog space is where you see uh, the Chinese government trying to play catch up because they haven't so far developed a way to really completely control the microblog. And the other thing about microblogs, Twitters, is that it allows individuals to become these public personalities with large numbers of followers. So just about, I mean, including people like reform economists with hundreds of thousands, if not millions of followers. And that has, uh, is really potentially quite threatening uh, politically to the Chinese government. So um, I have confidence that, there, that the Chinese state will never be able to con completely control this. 
But it, I think most of us have been sobered by the fact that if you look at search, for example, uh, still 95% uh, or more of the searches in China are done to Chinese sites. Mm -hmm. You know, the Great Firewall around China still persists. And a lot of this evasion software to climb the wall does not seem to be easily adopted. So that's not working as well as we thought. Um, and then the fact that the Chinese government, including the private firms like Sina, you know, are so dependent on the party, the propaganda authorities, they're practically part of the Chinese state. So uh, really the most powerful methods are not the technological ones. They're the political and sociological ones and economic ones. Um, and that is very, very difficult to break. You know, um, I saw a posting recently of a foreigner in China who said, you know, uh, posted, hey guys, I want to get on Facebook, but I can't seem to be doing, uh, to gain access, duh. Um, uh, and what should I do? And the responses were very interesting from other netizens. They were things like, well, help us get democracy first, and then we'll help you get on Facebook. So I think there's, I think the, uh, the netizens, there is a growing sophistication about the censorship and a growing frustration among people who otherwise would not be politically active, that they are very frustrated that they are being treated like children. And I think eventually it could become a focal point for an opposition movement. Oh, interesting. I have Twitter scale questions for each of our two tech people here. I was asking uh, Evan Williams, you know, the main thing that he knows from his world that he wishes Ever, other people to know, what's the main thing you know in Twitter scale from being in the middle of this wireless technology you wish the rest of us knew? Um, just the impact that wireless is having on the emerging markets because you're we're giving people who had no access to education and health and all sorts of information for the first time access to that and they could be the next Steve Jobs. Who knows where the next innovation is going to come from but in our lifetime, you know, literally billions of people will be connected to the internet for the first time, and that, I think, is going to have a profound impact on the world. And Larry, the main thing you wish we all knew? Well, I think that the fact that your body has all of these data available for measuring and that the, and that the speed with which the uh, cost is going down means that we will be able to do this in a, in, a, in a very routine way for a large number of people. And, the, and I think the reason at CalIT2 we have a lot of projects, you know, sort of living in the future of this is because we've got to get a whole new medical community trained. Um, and and, and I, think, I think that's the real problem that so many of the current medical community really don't see this coming and don't have a way to get it into clinical practice in a fast way, the way we assume things happen in internet speed. To keep the program moving, what we should do right now is I hope you'll join me in thanking our panelists, Susan Scherf, Larry Smart, and Peggy Johnson.